This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. I just invite you right now to lift your hands toward heaven and worship God. Father, we praise you. We glorify you, God. You're a mighty God. And God, we give you honor and praise. You are the creator. You are the author and finisher of our faith. God, we glorify you right now. and We praise you. We worship you. We worship you. Hallelujah. 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 Father, as we worship, I pray. I pray, God, an awakening. I pray, God, for a revival. I pray, God, for re renewal. God, we pray that in this world where sin does abound, and your grace does much more abound, that you would awaken your church. God, awaken your church in these last days. We pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit power. God, we glorify you. We praise you. We worship you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. It's so wonderful to visit with you again. And um, it's such a privilege to come and be with you on this day. And we honor you. And um, I bless you. <clears throat> I bring greetings from all of our churches and to you as we journey together as a body of Christ. Amen. And um, we're so glad that this incredible church, Eternal Life, is a Church of God congregation. That we're together in this journey, worshiping God, praising God, and lifting up the name of Jesus and praying for people to be born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, I thought I'd get a greater response out of that. I tell you what. <clears throat> You know, it is such a treacherous world we live in. And in the very moment that you think it won't get any worse, things get worse. And things are more challenged. Immorality is crazily happening everywhere we go. And there is a great onslaught of the enemy to tear down, to destroy, to deconstruct Christianity, morality, and everything that makes sense in this Bible. But as we navigate the waters that we now find ourselves in culturally. I communicate to you that I am so excited that God has put forward His Word, His presence, His Son Jesus Christ in a community of faith that we can gather together and we can worship God. And you know and I know around this world there is great persecution upon many people that worship God. I mean the God of Jehovah, the God Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The one God, the true God, the creator God, our God Adonai. His son is Jesus Christ, and he walks, he sent, he lives, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. And here we are. And the reality is there are many challenges. You can go to India today, and there are Hindus that will burn down churches. There is a great persecution today in your home country of India. And we must pray for India. And we need to pray for every Pentecostal, every believer, every church, that God will protect those churches. And that God will save every Hindu person that doesn't know Jesus. And every Janist and every uh, Punjabi that's a Sikh worshiper, and everybody who is far away from God, that there would be a revival presence and power in the nation of India in Asia. We also need to pray for every person in this nation, in this nation that is seeing its journey slide to a morass of immorality. And we watched this last week as the President of the United States in the last few days uh, has declared all kind of things as being morally right. And they are absolutely against God and against His Word. We need miracles in this nation. We need a revival in this nation. We need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this nation. I believe that God wants to bring revival to the United States of America and to the world globally. Amen. Amen. I'm honored to be here today. I'm so glad that Cheryl is traveling with me. We honor you today. And I want to share with you a few things. First, I'm very excited and honored to always greet you. And I thank you for joining with us as the family of God on this journey. 
and we are working very diligently, diligently. The Church of God in California and Nevada, this Pentecostal movement, today our regional office um, leads, guides, coaches, uh, supports, and ministers among 124 churches in California and Nevada. To God be the glory. Um, I am praying that God will help us as a body of Christ to plant many more churches. Now, let me explain why. Because we can get into this whole journey of human flesh um, pride. Amen. And there is, there can be an organizational pride that is unhealthy. But I'm just going to tell you straightforward, um, we're part of the body of Christ. We are in the body of Christ. And there are organizations in the body of Christ professing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And here's the fact, we need each other. And strategically in this world, we have to maneuver and we have to do those things which are uh, appropriate, even in the legal side of things, in our government. And so being under the, um, the auspices, if you will, of a non-profit organization, a religious non-profit organization, and being able to communicate Jesus Christ in freedom is an important value in this nation. We're praying that we don't lose that value. We know that there's an attack on churches. There's an attack on Christianity today in this nation. And some of that attack is overt. Most of it's covert. Most of it's underlying and it's even de deconstructing what it means to be a Christian. And so in this reality, I am thankful for an organization that lives up, lifts up the name of Jesus Christ in the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. So when I say multiply or plant and grow churches, there are scholars who are now in heaven and others today that aren't who have studied and said for many years that the number one most effective way to win people to Christ is to plant a new church. Amen. Uh, that's proven statistically. It's proven in history. It's a biblical process. God is a going God, and this is a going book. Amen. He said, go unto all the world and make disciples of all nations. And so this is our cry and our cause. Why? Because we want to do all we can to rescue lost sinners and help them find Jesus Christ, that they would be redeemed and have eternal life in God. Amen. This is the process. And right here in this state, in California, there are 40, 40, there's 40 million people. And if less than 10% of this population attends church on a Sunday, whether online or in person, we have a lot of work to do. Amen. So we've got 36 million people. Let's be generous and say 20% of the population follows Jesus. Well, uh, we still have 32 million people. Did I get that right? Some of the brilliant engineers in this room. I think I got that right. So, um, the fact is we have much work to do. And we can hide. We can be quiet or shy. We can give up and we can quit or we can persevere. And we can say that the light of Jesus Christ invades this world and pushes out darkness. And people who are from every tribe, every nation, every culture, every language, every person on this planet has the opportunity to be reconciled by the living power of Jesus Christ in their lives. Together, we can make a difference. Amen. I ask you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 7. And I'm going to dwell here in a few minutes, and I'm going to talk and share. Now, I'll preach for a little while, and then we're going to pray together, and we're going to have communion together. The Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. <clears throat> As I share this message with you today, I am drawn to this message for this season in time and for this moment. The title of this message is simply this, Upon This Rock. Upon this rock. And I'm going to share in just a moment from Scripture, but before I do, 
I share with you this. There is a man named Robert Robinson. In 1758, he wrote a song. And the title of that song is, Come Thou Fount. He was a disciple of John Wesley and his brother Charles. And he joined that movement that would become known eventually as the Wesleyan movement. And eventually formed the Methodist Church. But in that moment, in that time, it was not a liberal movement. It was not a movement that had forsaken its values. It was a movement of Jesus. And John Wesley preached the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout Europe and around, and then in this nation as it was forming. He traveled by ship, he traveled by horse, horseback, he walked. I like John Wesley for a few reasons. One, he was five foot one. Praise the Lord. A lot of times I look up to people. And I wouldn't look down to John Wesley. I look up to him, but it, wow, he inspires me. Five foot one preacher. Another reason I love him is he was a praying person. I had the opportunity to visit his house a few years ago in London. And we went to that house and we walked into that house and on a tour. It's a museum now. And they took us to the first floor and they showed us around. And they took us to the second floor. And they said, this is John Wesley's bedroom. This is where he passed away. This is where he slept. This is where he died. He died in that bed. And they said, there's another room. And we went into the next room. And the next room was about a seven foot by a six foot or seven by eight foot room. It was a small room. It would be the size of a walk-in closet in a large house in the United States, perhaps. And in this small room, they said this was not his, as somebody said, this was his closet. So this was his prayer room. And it became known as the boiler room for Methodism and the movement of Wesleyan holiness. But it is in that room that he would get up every morning at 4 and 5 a.m. and sometimes pray through the night. And he would pray. And he would pray for the gospel to be heard around the world. He would pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ would change the lives of men and women. He would pray that there would be a revival. And this five foot one holiness preacher would pray and pray and pray and pray. He was a prayer force. He was a man with integrity and tenacity. And this man, Robert Robinson, who wrote this song, was a disciple of John Wesley. I just read these words. We know this song, many of us. But I love the words. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet. Sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. The second verse is simply this. Here I raise my Ebenezer. The language in this song is powerful. Tongues of fire from above. Tongues of flaming tongues from above. Here I raise my Ebenezer. The, de and the word Ebenezer defined is simply this. A rock of hope. My rock of hope. I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure. Safely to arrive at home. Home is heaven. Because when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, governmental authorities may want a passport and a citizenship, but my citizenship is like Abraham, who was a sojourner looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. We're passing through this world on our way to an eternity with God. And when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are citizens of an eternal kingdom, not of this world. Hallelujah. Amen. And then this verse, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter, a chain, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. 
O take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wander. Yes, we are fleshly people. We are created in the image of God, but the image was broken in the garden when sin entered the world. But And through one man, sin entered the world. But I must tell you today, through one man, grace came. And His name is Jesus Christ. And He is our Ebenezer, our rock of hope. And it is upon this rock He builds His church. To God be the glory. The Bible says... In 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 5. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. In verse 6 and following, And they gathered together to Mizpah, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb, a baby lamb. A lamb that did not know the stain of the world. A lamb that would be inspected by the high priest. That would be inspected by the priest. Inspected by the rabbinical establishment of Levites. They would inspect this lamb and look at the lamb and make sure it did not have spot. It was not flawed in any way. And he would take this baby lamb, and the Bible says, And he offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel. And the Lord heard him. Aren't you glad the Lord hears our cry? And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder. And on that day upon the Philistines, and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah, and pursued the Philistines, and smote them, until they came under Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone, and he set it between Mizpah and Shin, and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more under the coast of Israel and the hand of the Lord was upon the Phil- was a- was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel and the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron even unto Gath and the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites and Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life and he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel in all those places And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and from there he built an altar unto the Lord. Verse 12 for emphasis, Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin, and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Father, we thank you for your love. God, we glorify you today, and we pray your blessings on your word. God, we ask you to anoint us, to touch us, to guide us. Open our ears that we may hear. God, open our mouths that we may speak. Give us vision to transform the world as you've transformed us. If there's one person in this sanctuary or online that does not know you as Lord and Savior, does not have a relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ, and relationship with you, we pray, God, that they would come to that saving knowledge even now. And God, we pray that you would raise us up upon your rock to shake this earth, to shake this nation and shake this city in the power of your word, in the power of your Holy Spirit. God, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is a very powerful story in Scripture. It is a historical fact.
It is a reality that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken away by the Philistines. It is a reality that when the Ark of the Covenant was in the land of the Philistines, that there was great travail and many things happened. It is a fact that there were significant things that had taken place in this moment. And when the presence of God in that Ark of the Covenant had come back into the nation of Israel, Samuel gathered all the people after a time after a number of days after a number of weeks after a number of years even the Ark of the Covenant had been taken away and it had been 20 years in one house and they brought it to another place and then Samuel would gather everybody to this place it was a mountaintop it was a place called Mizpah and they would gather there and they would form a new covenant with God now, in our lives as Christians, as believers, there are times where we must devote ourselves. You've been fasting and praying yesterday and today. And we fast consistently as a people. We pray. We read the Word of God. We dwell in the Word of God. Why do we do that? Because we must remain in covenant with God. And there are ways that we can wander far from God. As I mentioned the words of that song, we are prone to wander. We have a propensity for sin. We have a propensity in the flesh that we're born with to walk in a way that is contrary to the ways of God. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. The Bible says, be holy as I am holy, for without holiness no one will see God. We need the presence of God in in our life and the holiness of God and the only way to maintain that process is a relationship and a commitment and a devotion that puts away things of the world and focuses on the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. And so it was in this moment he called everybody together and it was as if he was saying to them, we need to recommit, we need to rededicate, we need to stop for a moment. And they fasted and they prayed and they gave offerings and they poured out and they sanctified that moment. They cleansed the area. And they sacrificed unto God. And it was in this moment they would, they would make a covenant, a new covenant to God. And they would say, we're going to follow you. We're not going to follow the gods of the Philistines. We're not going to follow the gods of this world. We're not going to succumb to the temptations of this world. We're going to stop right here on this mountaintop. And we're going to declare that the God of Je the God Jehovah, the God uh, of our fathers, that God who created this earth and created us, we are going to worship Him, we're going to praise Him, and we're going to follow Him, and we're going to lift Him up. You see that word Mizpah, it means covenant. It means a relationship of covenant. And right there, in that moment, it means covenant, it means promise, it is about destiny, it is about future, it is about commitment, it is a place in our life where we say, I'm committed to you, God, I make a covenant with you, God. It is one thing to pray a sinner prayer. It is another thing to say a sinner's prayer and say, God, I'm not going back. I'm not going this way. I'm not going that way. I'm not going to the left or the right or any way else. I am following you every day that I live. I have a path in my life that I will follow Jesus. And they're gathered together and Samuel had brought them together and they've been fighting this enemy, this people for many years. And they gathered on that mountaintop, and when the enemy heard that they were gathered in one place together, strategically in their mind as warriors, as fighters, they realized our enemy Israel is all in one place, let's go get them. And Israel heard what was happening. And these men became fearful. And even in that moment, they became discouraged and fearful. And I must tell you today, we live in a moment of discouragement and fear. Every day, something new comes out in the news broadcast. And even the last few days, I almost have this, this lamentation, this weeping prophet presence of, God, I weep for this nation.
God, I mourn for the nation. I mourn for this world. There are wars and rumors of wars. There is a running away from God. There is a tearing down of all things holy. There is a destruction in our culture that wants to deconstruct morality. Well, now we are fighting with this immoral presence of a, a government that will say that anything goes any way you want to be. Do what you want to do. Live how you want to live. And not only are we going to accept that, but we're going to endorse it. And the reality is that God is not pleased and God is not mocked. And God will bring judgment on a land that, that spits in His face and communicates that there is no holiness and no justice and no morality. And we are in a very treacherous time. But the Bible is clear and I will declare this to you this morning. We are living in a Luke, a Matthew chapter 24 moment. We are living in a moment where we are living in the last days. And we say, Maranatha, the Lord come quickly. But as we say that, I communicate to you that we've got work to do as the body of Christ and the church, the people of God, we must go further, go farther, climb harder, climb higher, and pray more, and profess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and tell the world, this is how you can be saved. Oh, hallelujah! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. God created man and woman in His image. God created men to be married to women and women to be married to men and produce offspring and multiply. God did not create all of this deconstructing of what a man and a woman is. I must tell you we're created in the image of God and in His image we worship Him and I must tell you today that there is a morality in this scripture Scripture and this Bible is true, and we must not deviate from the path of the Word of God. Hallelujah. Samuel gathered everybody there, and they were praying, and they ran to him and said, Please keep praying for us. Don't stop. Don't stop praying for us. Cry to the Lord for us that His hand will be upon us, and His hand will be against the Philistines. And then the Bible says this. Samuel would take a lamb, a suckling lamb, and he would sacrifice it. You see, in our day today, at any time in history, we look at the realm of humanity. Humanity needs help. They need redemption from their sinful condition. We need redemption from our sinful condition. Redeem literally means to set free and rescue. Praise God we have a Redeemer named Jesus Christ. To God be the Lord glory. The Bible is clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans chapter 3 verse 23. The Bible is clear that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. The Bible is clear that whoever calls upon the name of Jesus Christ shall be saved. I'm a whoever, whosoever, and I praise God. I've called on the name of Jesus Christ, and I am born again and set free. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ came to give life. He came to set people free. 1 Peter, Peter chapter 1, verses 17 and 19 says this, knowing, you, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot or blemish. The Bible says in John 10 and 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus Christ came to give people life. He is our peace who has broken down every wall. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14, the Bible says, For He Himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. You see, I declare to you, and I commend 
submit to you. And Samuel, in this moment, is telling everybody around, uh, Jesus, he, he says to them that he takes a suckling lamb, a baby lamb, and he sacrifices that lamb. Now, isn't it powerful in the foreshadowing of this moment that there is only one way we can be born again, and it is the blood of the lamb covers our sins. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 19, the Bible says that Jesus Christ was a lamb without blemish or spot. And in this moment, on this mountain, before Jesus Christ was born on this earth, in all of these days, here in the Old Testament, Samuel takes a suckling lamb and he sacrifices it right there and he sheds blood and he covers the sins of the people with this Old Testament sacrifice. And the reality is this, that Jesus Christ is not only the lamb whose blood was shed from the foundation of the world, but Jesus Christ is our cornerstone. The Bible says, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone. A tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the, firm, firm, for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. Isaiah 28 verse 16. It is on this rock, the rock of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone that the church is built. Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 to 18 says this. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to them, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overwhelm it or overpower it. I want to share with you today for a few moments. Upon this rock, God builds His church. It is the rock of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, that God builds His church. Our church is built on the rock of Jesus Christ. It's not in the, it's not the building, it's not the chairs, it's not the carpet, it's not how beautiful the building is, or, or how not beautiful the building is, or if we have a building or don't building, have a building. You see, the building is not the church, it is the people that come to worship God. We are the church. We are the living church of the living God. The transforming power of Jesus Christ builds His church. First of all, I share with you today, we have to have a, a level of repentance in our life. If we want to be transformed by God, we have to have repentance. If we want to come to God and form a covenant, a prom, a, have a promise with God that is connected. He's already made the promise. It's our part to come and covenant with God. And that takes a moment of repentance. Repentance changes the atmosphere. Repentance shifts the atmosphere. It takes things out of our mind. We say, Lord, I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me, to separate me, to clear my mind of all the things that I'm thinking about. There is a moment that changes the atmosphere in our life, in our house, in our car, and in our mind. When we can walk without the burden of sin and the burden of, of oppression and depression and discouragement, and we understand that when we are present with Jesus Christ, there is strength in our life no matter what happens. There is hope in our life no matter what happens. Repentance changes the atmosphere. Repentance repositions our standing with God. Reposi repositions are standing with God. Repos repentance is our pathway to renewal. Second of all today, renewal. Renewal replenishes our soul. There is a freshness that comes. When we say, okay, I'm going to turn off my telephone. I'm going to turn off the internet. I'm going to turn off the television. I'm going to turn off all the things that distract my mind. It could be a video game. It could be uh, Netflix or some other app app on your phone or in your television. It could be some program, some sport, anything that collectively bothers the mind and keeps us from worshiping God. Set it aside. Well, Pastor Sean... 
You see, there is a moment in our life where we have to just say, God, I'm going to give you this. And I'm going to say, Lord, I need more of you and less of me. Renewal replenishes our soul. When we take stuff out and we open up space, God can move in our lives in a greater way. Now for me, let me just live this out for a moment. I was a news junkie. What does that mean? It means I was like an addict, right? Everybody say amen. And I would watch the news all the time. Every station. I'd watch CNN, Fox News, whatever. Uh, I'd watch, I'd find news stations and watch the news. And Cheryl told me one day, she said, you're yelling at the TV. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. She said, yeah, you are. And I realized I sound like my grandfather yelling at the TV. Come on, somebody. And I realized something. This is really bothering me. And it's, mess it's making me agitated, frustrated, irritated, depressed, discouraged, and sometimes even angry. And then I realized something. The news people really don't care what you think or believe as long as you watch their broadcast. Because anything they can get you to do to watch that news program equals one thing for them. Money. 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 And it makes me miserable. So I turn off the TV. <sighs> Renewal. God, I'm, I'm, I'm opening up this space. And I need you to fill it. I need you to fill it. Renewal replenishes our soul. I think about David when he cried out after his sin, created me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. Renewal replenishes our soul. There is a freshness that comes, like drinking from a fresh spring of water. Renewal transforms our worship. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe you've felt like you were going through the motions sometimes. I can turn on Christian music sometimes and just feel like it doesn't mean one thing to me, that song, because I'm worn out with it and it, it just doesn't minister in the way that would just grab my soul. And part of the reason is that happens is because I need to be transformed in my worship. And when I say, God, renew me and cleanse me and set me apart and bring a freshness in my life, then it could be a song. It may not even be played in the right key. And I'm not advocating that. But it, it could be a song that's old, new, or not. It could be a song the Holy Spirit gives me and you that nobody's ever heard the words of before. But there is a renewal in our soul. And it transforms our worship. And you may find yourself singing unto the Lord, even if you're like me, who I can't really sing. I'm not a singer. I promise you. Our daughter is a singer. And she's a trained vocalist. And she will roll her eyes at me when I sing. Because I'm no singer. But I'm a worshiper. And I walk around sometimes and I just sing, Lord, I'm hungry. Lord, I'm hungry for a mighty move of God. Lord, I'm thirsty. Pour out your Holy Ghost. Lord, I want to see the hand of God. Moving mightily inside of me. Lord, I'm hungry for a move of God. When we receive renewal from the Holy Spirit, our worship is transformed. He 
ba 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 I'll just worship him, church. Hallelujah. 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 Soto da mama makata da bokota da baba pakata da basika da batoda da batai. Holy Spirit, come in this place. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. 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 Sotana mama makot. Walking through the valley of the shadow of death, worship Him. When you're walking over the mountain, worship Him. When you're walking through illness and sickness, worship Him. When you're having a battle of the mind, worship Him. When you've been to the fountain, worship Him. When you've been in the valley, worship Him. Hallelujah! There's power in the praises of His people. When your praises go up, His glory comes down. Hallelujah! Worship Him, church. Holy Spirit, move in this house, we pray. Hallelujah! 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 Santo Kodara Baba Bakatara Bapate. Sandolo Bokodara. Hallelujah. 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 You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are holy. 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 It's the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah, 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 what that simply means is this. It's one thing to praise God on Sunday. It's an entirely different thing to live a life of Christ on Monday. In a siloed world, in a world that would compartmentalize everything, 
There are people that will tell you, you can have your religion, you can have your faith. You can do what you want on your Sunday morning, in your hour, in your spot. But don't bother me on Monday. But I've got news for you. Jesus Christ did not come and give His life just so you can be whole in one hour on Sunday morning or two hours or three. He came and gave His life so you can live life and life abundantly. On Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And you may walk in the most pagan workplace on this planet. You may walk in those pagan, uh, filled with immorality and, and, and atheistic thinking school system on this planet. But when you walk in with Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you walk in as a victor. You walk in as a worshiper. You walk in with authority. And every place you place your foot on the ground you have victory and authority and power in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Everywhere you go, He will go with you. He goes before you. He goes behind you. He is with you all the way. Hallelujah! Restoration returns what is lost. Just pray with me right now for a moment. God, we pray for every son and daughter of the house. We pray for those who have wandered off. We pray for those who are living in sin. We pray for those that have experienced a deconstruction and a philosophical misinterpretation of who you are. And God, we pray that you would reconcile their worldview, redeem their soul. We pray for those who have wandered off. God, we pray for those that are here in this sanctuary and online today as part of the church. These young men and young women today who profess Scripture as part of the Sunday school uh, learning process. And we pray your protection upon them. God, guard them from the enemy. Guard their soul. Guard their mind. Guard their life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Restoration returns what is lost. Restoration guards and guides our future. Restoration provides momentum to fulfill mission, our destiny. The Bible says that Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath Jehovah helped us. I, I love this scripture. I love the prophetic uh, foreshadowing in this scripture, lifting up the name of Jesus Christ, even before the name of Jesus Christ had been spoken in history already. Samuel is taking a lamb that is a pure, pure in this world and sacrificing that lamb. And we know from Scripture, because we have a, a view looking backward, he had a view looking forward, and we understand that Jesus Christ is the lamb without spot. And his blood was shed on a cross to redeem us and set us free. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then the Bible says that he took a rock and he called it Ebenezer. Our rock of hope. I tell you this morning that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the Valley, the Alpha and the Omega, the wheel within the wheel, Jesus Christ, the everlasting to everlasting, Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, the Center Freer, Jesus Christ, whose blood was shed, Jesus Christ, who was crucified on a cross and went to a grave and three days later rose out of the grave with the keys of death and hell in the grave. He was victorious. He was victorious. Oh, He was victorious. Hallelujah, Jesus Christ. Our victor is our rock of hope. He is our Ebenezer. Hallelujah. Samuel would take that rock and he would set it down between Mizpah and Shin. And he called it Ebenezer, our rock of hope. And today I tell you, in history, Mizpah means covenant or promise. Mizpah speaks to our future and our destiny. I 
encourage you today. God's not finished with His church. God has not quit His church. God has not given up on us. God is still fighting for us. He is still walking with us. He still has us in His mind. And Jesus Christ is still our warrior triumphant. Jesus Christ is still the only being in the universe, in history that went to a grave and three days later walked out. There's no Buddha that got out of a grave. There's no Hindu God fashioned by the hands of man that got up out of a grave. There is no Muslim God that got out of a grave. But I'm telling you today, Jesus Christ, the Lord of King, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings on that third day kicked open the tomb and walked out of the grave triumphant and victorious and powerful and holy and righteous and to God be the glory. Right now today we stand upon His rock. He is our rock of hope. Here is only one rock. He is still the one rock. He is still the one way. He is the rock of our hope. He is our God Almighty, our strong power and we can run into it and we are saved. He is Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible says that he put that rock down between Mizpah and Shin. Mizpah means covenant or promise. Shin, scholars cannot tell you where it is or what it means. But as I've studied and read and looked for and found, the only place that Shin can be identified as potentially a town or a city or a village that existed in ancient history and which was across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And that the children of Israel would walk through as they journeyed into the land of promise. And they passed through Shin in their past. And so I look at this scripture and I read and I think to myself. And I'm praying. And the Holy Spirit moves on my heart. The realization that if we're going to move from our past... If we're going to walk from our past, if we're going to walk out of a past, a life, a world that we could have been in or we might have been in before we found Jesus. It might be our mindset or our thinking. It might be sin that we've committed. If we're going to walk out of the past and into our promise, we have to stand on the rock. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is our rock of hope. And it is upon this rock that God builds His church. It is upon this rock we have victory. Pentecostal theological thinking is this. It's powerful, scriptural, and biblical. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Jesus Christ is our Sanctifier means He cleans us up. Jesus Christ is our Holy Spirit baptizer. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is our healer. And Jesus Christ is our soon coming King. Hallelujah. Upon this rock, He builds His church. Upon this rock, we stand. We see we're not wrapped up in a religion. We're, re we're really wrapped up in a relational movement that is connected with the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. Don't try to compare me with the Buddhist and the Muslim and the Sikh and the Hindu and the New Age worshiper. Nothing like that. There's no comparison. Because there is no other entity that breathed life into humanity. That separated night from day and land from water. And in the very moment that sin entered the world, he had a mission that through his son Jesus Christ, we would be redeemed from our sin. And that Lord and Savior is the only one who's ever walked out of a grave, resurrected in His own power. To God be the glory.
Stand with me, if you will. First of all, this morning, I communicate to you. You may have been in the church for many years, and perhaps you come because of a spouse. Or maybe this is your first time watching this broadcast or being in the church. I communicate to you that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And He came to give life a life abundantly. And He came to redeem you from your sins. And the Bible was clear, as I've shared earlier in this message, that everybody ever born in this world was born into sin. And that the wages of sin, the penalty for sin is death. Eternal death. But whoever calls upon the name of Jesus Christ, whoever says, I want to follow Jesus Christ, whoever receives Jesus Christ and commits their life to Jesus Christ, shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from an eternity without God. Saved from an eternal life in a sinful world. Saved from an eternal life in a place of damnation, a place called hell. Whosoever calls on the name of Jesus Christ shall be saved. Today I want to ask everybody here to bow your head and close your eyes. And if you're watching online, I just invite you, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. In fact, I'll ask everyone here to pray this prayer so you're not all by yourself. But I want to invite you to invite Jesus into your life, into your heart, into your soul, and be free. Pray with me, everybody. Father, oh, come on, pray out loud. Father, I'm a sinner, and I ask you to save me. Save me because I declare that Jesus Christ is my Lord. I call upon the name of Jesus. And I declare today that I leave my old life and I follow you. I ask to be born again and set free. And I thank you for saving me. Amen. Father, I pray for any person who has prayed that prayer today. For the first time, or maybe they backslidden and they're not following you and they prayed that prayer long ago, but today's a moment. It's a covenant. It's a renewal. It's a restoration. It's a victory. And God, I pray today that you would cover them and inspire them. And at this place of Mizpah, standing on your rock, who's Jesus Christ, Father, we pray you would bless their lives in power and victory. And God, as we take Holy Communion in a few moments, that you would empower them and awaken them even now. God, we glorify you and we praise you. With everybody standing today, I just invite you, if you need a miracle in your life, Pastor Sean, I need a healing miracle. I need a family miracle. I need a financial miracle. I need an immigration miracle. I need a miracle in my life. I need a relationship miracle. I'm going to pray for you today, and I just invite you, if you need a miracle right now where you stand, I'm going to pray that through the next few minutes, in this prayer moment, and in the Holy Communion moment, that God brings a miracle in your life. And I pray that when God brings that miracle, you absolutely can define the moment that the miracle happens. And then you'll have a testimony. A testimony of a new job, a testimony of a financial miracle in the mail, a testimony of an immigration miracle, a testimony of a healing miracle in your body, a healing miracle in your marriage, in your family, in your life. And so right now, if you say, Pastor Sean, I want you to pray for me. I need a miracle right now today. I invite you to just lift your hand up. And I want to pray for you as we pray today. God, we pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I pray for every person in their, this sanctuary with their hand raised right now saying, I need a miracle from you, O oh God. God, we pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that you would provide a miracle in their life. Father, I pray a miracle of healing right now over diabetes, 
a miracle of healing in Jesus name over diabetes in the name of Jesus Christ our healer over diabetes God heal from diabetes we pray for a divine miracle in a heart situation right now God that you would take do a cardiac miracle in the name of Jesus Christ our healer God we pray for a cardiac miracle right now we pray for a healing miracle in the body God healing over disease over sickness over everything that attacks our physical being father we pray now for a miracle in a husband and wife relationship we pray for a divine miracle in a family right now God we pray for a divine miracle in a in a business situation we pray for a divine miracle right now with a, a job situation God we pray for a better job to show up a new job to show up God a resource and not lack God we pray for a financial miracle we pray for uh, an individual right now that's praying for a decision they're about to make I pray God that you would give them wisdom in that decision discernment and a miracle in that business decision that they're, they're, they're working and praying to make and God that you would enlighten them you would open their mind right Right now we pray God that you would give them wisdom and it would be wisdom that would prosper their life and your kingdom in Jesus name and God we pray today for an immigration miracle we pray for life miracles we pray for victory in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth we declare we declare Jesus Christ is our Savior and Jesus Christ is our healer and our miracle maker in Jesus name hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's just give the Lord praise.